Dickinson was the constant source of inspiration and creativity. Music making always seems to have been present in the Dickinson household. The Dickinsons were a well-to-do family that could afford to buy the latest music books or sheet music, and of course, a piano on which to play it. In a letter to her childhood friend, Abaya Root, Emily gives us a window in which to view her musical activities. It's clear that Emily was a determined piano student. I was also much pleased, especially that you were taking lessons on the piney, as you always call it. But remember not to get on ahead of me. Father intends to have a piano very soon. How happy I shall be when I have one of my own. Edward Dickinson did purchase a very beautiful piano the following year through his brother William in Worcester. And Elizabeth Vale Selby, a Dickinson relative, an honorary aunt spent the summer of 1845 with the Dickinson family in their home on North Pleasant Street. Emily was able to tell her friend a buyer who. I have the same instruction book that you have, 13, and I am getting along in it very well. And Selby says she shan't let me have many tunes now, for she wants I should get over in the book good ways first. I have been learning several beautiful pieces lately. The Grave of Bonaparte is one, Lancer's Quick Step, Wood Up, and Maiden Weep No More, which is a sweet little song. I want much to see you and hear you play. Like all young piano students, Emily seems to prefer the popular tunes as she refers to them, rather than the instruction exercises in the Bertini piano method. Primarily by a woman 
during their formative years of musical training, the conclusion of which coincided with marriage. These musical keepsakes generally contained exclusively popular vocal music today and often commemorated attendance at live musical events, which was an increasingly important activity in antebellum America. Music publishers responded to these trends by marketing sheet music as performed by the star performers of the day to a growing middle class who enjoyed listening to music and music making, both as a gratifying experience and as a signifier of cultural gentility and upward mobility. The size of Emily Dickinson's music book is extraordinary. The average binder's volume contains about 40 to 50 pieces of music. Emily Dickinson's book contains just over 100 pieces. The average binder's volume usually contains vocal music suitable for parlor entertainment. In contrast, more than half of the Dickinson book contains instrumental piano music, such as marches, anthems, and quicksteps. The remainder are popular vocal pieces of the day. Preference 
for the smaller melodic ranges associated with traditional Irish or other vernacular tunes which may have been part of her improvisations. A Dickinson neighbor during her lifetime, McGregor Jenkins, recounts in his memoir, Emily Dickinson, friend and neighbor, that Emily went often across the lawn to her brother's house. It was through him and his handsome wife that she kept in touch with the life of her circle and to a considerable extent with the village and the world. She would improvise a tune which she laughingly called the devil. And when her father came, lantern in hand, to see that, that she had reached home in safety, she would elude him and dart through the darkness to reach home before him. This was pure mischief, and there was much of it in her. Of dishonor, one of the most memorable treatises 
of the U.S. government's treatment of Native Americans.
sure she won't mind me saying that Leslie mentioned to me in an email several weeks ago that they are about to digitize the Dickinson music book. So, of course, no one is happier about that than I am. So, uh, I look forward to that. <laughs>